So a um, couple couple of things I was going to say, you know, because I I taught school for 13 years, right. taught uh, an HVAC program at Cuyahoga Valley Career Center up in Brexville, Ohio, and one of the things uh, with the iManifold app, you know, we when when you really stop and think about what it does, and it's sort of like going from uh, watching, looking at trying to diagnose by pictures, one reading at a time, make a reading, sort of look at it, see what's going on there, make another reading make another reading, and then all of a sudden going to video camera and seeing everything happen at once. And I think, you know, a, a lot of guys don't appreciate when I When I tell somebody it actually makes you a better tech, it's because you actually see all the relationships of everything happening at one time. You get to see, uh, as soon as you add gas, what happens to the low side, what happens to the high side, what happens to the superheat, what happens to subcooling, what happens to your uh, air, to your uh, um your latent sensible split, your your latent cooling, your sensible cooling, um, you know. And if you're watching on trending, I, I use trending a lot. Uh, it's probably my favorite feature, the I manifold. Um, you actually get to see how small changes in uh, in charge or airflow or um, cleaning the condenser how it improves the equipment performance. And I don't think a lot of people have ever got to see everything in one fell swoop because you're not you know, even things like um, watching the load change. Uh, you know, as you start up a system, you're going to see at first if it's r r really hot in the house, you have a lot of capacity. And as the house cools down, the capacity of the machine will drop off. The humidity will drop. The the sensible cooling will drop. And those are things you can't, uh, you know, you, you normally don't have an opportunity to see because you're not inside watching each variable independently. So I think, you know, and also, uh, we live test everything uh, on the iManifold application. I have uh, equipment in the lab, and then I, I go on our rooftop units at work, or a lot of times I'm out in the field. Um, in the wintertime, I'll fly down to Florida. And I've got 28 years of experience now, and I cannot beat my own application in troubleshooting. Because all the readings come in at one time, and it's diagnosing up to 50 points of data at once, no matter how good of a technician you are, you can't work faster than the computer works, at, at least to get put into the right direction. And obviously the trick with, with accurate troubleshooting is accurate profiling, which is probably the biggest challenge for most technicians is understanding how to properly profile a system. But once you get that element of the application down, then uh, the rest of it's really easy. That's a good way to put it. it shows you the relationship in real time. That's that's a good way to put it. Uh, yeah, if you really start um, uh, watching what's going on, it's an excellent teaching tool. You know, I even use it offline all the time when I'm looking at uh, psychometric calculations or what happens, especially if you just, if you take a young technician and uh, you have it working on, a, like a lot of times we'll use a, uh, a little window air conditioner and put it in the shop where the load doesn't change. And we'll just talk about okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna block off the evaporator coil with this piece of paper here. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen to the low pressure? A lot most people know. What's gonna happen to the high pressure? What's gonna happen to the superheat? What's gonna happen to the subcooling? And when you're on a fixed orifice system, and all of a sudden you start to see not only does the suction pressure drop, but the evaporator starts to flood, the condenser starts to starve, the suction pressure drops because we're we're not absorbing heat which drops the high pressure because we're not absorbing heat, and the amp draw starts to drop off, you start to see the, how, the, how each part of the system affects the entire system. And, that, and that's where uh, we get fixated as technicians a lot of times when you're troubleshooting. You, uh, and right now, the entire industry is fixated on superheat and subcooling, which are part of the equation but they aren't the entire equation by any means. In fact, the, the pressures, the only reason we measure pressure is to get temperature, which most people don't think about, but that temperature of the coils is the driver for the heat transfer. And so, obviously, the evaporator is colder than the return air, which drives the rate of heat transfer based on the time, the temperature difference in the turbulence. Condenser is hotter than the outdoor air, which drives the rate of heat transfer out of it. So those two temperatures are probably the most critical things as far as the rate of heat transfer in a system, and we neglect them all the time as an industry as a whole. And if you had grown up in refrigeration, uh, I don't know if any of you guys do refrigeration, but almost everybody in refrigeration, they're fixated on saturation temperatures. 
they almost never really look at pressures. They don't even think in pressures. It's a whole different mindset. And uh, the air conditioning industry never caught on to that for some reason, probably because it was really uh, started by plumbers. You know, that's that went into, we had obviously heating, steam heating, hot water heating. Uh, then we got into forced air heating and then cooling. And it was really the plumbing industry that started the, the cooling industry. So they didn't quite have all the experience the refrigeration mechanics had of the day. So, but anybody got any questions? Yeah, when you say uh, the you look at the pressures more than the temps, what exactly expand expand expound on that a little bit for us? So every coil is engineered with a what's called the, a design temperature difference. So you see in the application DTD. Right. I'm and sometimes you hear CTOA, which is condensing temperature over ambient. So what that means is how much colder is the evaporator supposed to be than the return air, and how much hotter is the condenser supposed to be than the outdoor air. Right. Okay? And by design, that's what's going to govern the rate of heat transfer into the evaporator and out of the condenser. So if you were to look at a spiral and temperature pressure chart, if you got one, you can pull it out and look at it. You'll see on the back side of the chart, it'll tell you, uh, design temperature differences for meat coolers, for ice machines, for all, all these different applications, probably about 10 different mm -hmm. applications. And uh, that's what the refrigeration industry focuses on most of the time. When they say, what's the, uh, what's the DTD for the evaporators? How much colder is the evaporator supposed to be than the freezer? So typically it'll be like 10 to 15 degrees colder than the, than the box temperature. Same exact thing in the air conditioning industry. But typically in our industry, uh, the evaporator is always 35 degrees colder than the return air. So if you had 75 degree return air minus 35, you had a 40 degree evaporator, right? Now, back in the day, the condenser, if, if you've got a couple years under your belt, you probably heard some old timer tell you condensing temp plus 30 or outdoor air temp plus 30. And that was the condenser is 30 degrees hotter than the outdoor air, okay? And so uh, as the condensers have gotten bigger, we have more surface area, so to transfer the same, remember heat is a quantity, so to transfer the same quantity of heat energy at a lower temperature difference requires a larger coil. Because right. we're moving BTUs, which is you know, a quantity of heat. So the larger the condenser gets, the lower the temperature difference has to be to transfer the same quantity of heat. So on a 10 sear piece of equipment, that temperature difference dropped from 30 degrees down to 25. And then when we get on a 13 sear, it drops down 13, 16 is about 20 degrees hotter than the outdoor air. And then you get into the 18 to 20 sear, you're getting down to about a 15 degree temperature mm -hmm. difference. Now here's the key thing. You know, you go, well, shoot, why don't we just make the condensers huge? And then we could get the temperature difference down to zero. Well, then the heat transfer would stop because you always, the condensers always got to be hotter. In other words, for heat to, for heat to transfer, it always travels one direction from hot to cold. If there's no temperature difference, the heat transfer stops. Yeah, you so can't because, cool it below ambient. Right? right, you can't cool it below the ambient. And in order for the refrigerant to change state, we have to have a pressure drop in order to change state. So the condenser, if it gets too big, you don't have enough pressure drop across your expansion device to drop the refrigerant down to its saturation temperature. So it, it, all, it all works together that way. So when you, when you get on a system, most of the time, the design temperature difference for the, for the evaporator is going to be 35 degrees. That's where I'd always start at. And then you just have to start looking at your condenser and figure out, you know, what's your, uh, what series of condenser. Now, if you're talking, um, I believe 1989 is when they came into the 10 sear, and it was, um, was it 2002? 12, they went to the, or 2002, they went to the 13 sear mandate? 6, 2006. 2006. So if you look at dates on equipment, you can pretty much tell, you know, what that is. Now, somebody asked, are we going to have the uh, a database of equipment? And actually, uh, yes, we just licensed the AHRI database. So they're going to put the entire AHRI database up in our cloud and it'll be able to pull down then models and serial numbers of equipment and it won't pull down design temperature difference because AHRI doesn't have that, but it will pull down the actual capacity, the rated capacity of the machine versus the nominal that we're working with right now. So hmm. uh, and it'll also yeah. start to pre-populate, you know, like uh, when you're in Google or something, you start to type out and it, and it starts 
pre-filling in the models or whatever, it'll start doing that also as you start typing in, you know, YCDO, 3O, and then it might start popping up the numbers behind it. You'll pick the one that you want to pick for the models and serial numbers. If you haven't gotten the latest version of the app out, we just put in barcode scanning. It's not released yet for Apple, but it is on Android. Apple will be out sometime this week, <laughs> and it'll... Uh, if, if the equipment has barcodes on it, you can you can or QR codes, either one it'll work on. You can pull in the models and serial numbers that way. Jim, from the outside, from someone looking in, it looks like the ARI does some wacky things to get the numbers kind of where they need them to be. Sometimes, as far as the CFMs that they're testing it at, would you agree with that, or what's your input on that? Well, it's not AHRI doing that. It's actually the manufacturers doing that. Okay, they're, yeah, right, they're, yeah. They're gaming the system. Mm -hmm. So what they're what they're doing is on some of these high efficiency systems, uh, like a Carrier Infinity system, for example, uh, it has a way oversized evaporator coil. So they drop the airflow down to uh, 350 cfm per ton. And if yeah. you if you look at the manual on the Carrier Infinity system, it's got a comfort mode and an efficiency mode uh, dip switch. And in the efficiency mode, it actually goes to 400 cfm per ton. And in the comfort mode, down to 350 CFM per ton. Now, when they test that at AHR, they test it at 400 CFM per ton to get the efficiency, the rated efficiency out of the piece of equipment. But Carrier knows that nobody's ever going to be comfortable at 400 CFM per ton because what happens when you oversize your evaporator coil is you raise your suction pressure. When you raise your suction pressure, you raise your suction temperature. When you raise this, the, the, the temperature of the evaporator coil, it no longer dehumidifies. So if you're out in Las Vegas, you're fine at 400 CFM per ton. You may even want to take it to 450 CFM a ton because you don't have any light and load to deal with. And in fact, if you're in Vegas and you don't run it at 400 to 450 CFM per ton, you'll never get your rated capacity out of it because the equipment's rated for light and load, and it just does, they don't have it out there. I could care less about dehumidification. Right, not, but if, not in my book, I could, doesn't ever enter here. If you install any system out in your area and you are at a nominal 400 CFM per ton in Vegas, you will never get like if you had a five-ton system, you'd be running about 47,600 BTUs, right, unless so. you get that airflow up to about 425 to 450 CFM per ton. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, so you'll see that all the time. It'll drive you crazy because yeah. all you're doing is a sensible cooling that the system is rated for because when AHR rates a piece of equipment, it's at 80 degrees return air dry bulb, 50% relative humidity, and 95 degrees outdoor air. Right. So if That's you have, really not any accurate. That's what it's rated for, but then they also have what's called typical design, which is 75 50 and 95. So anytime you drop the return air dry bulb, so if you go from 80 degrees down to 75 degrees, you're, you're automatically going to start losing capacity off the machine because it's rated for that higher return air dry bulb temperature. So, so. You, you typically will never see uh, close to your AHRI conditions unless you're doing a hot pull down in a home and you have humidity. Interesting. Yeah, which I'm in a in what we most would call a humid environment, Jim, and I'm still running my equipment about 425 per ton. I'm using large evaporators, and they're warm. They're like 25 below return air. Doing this with lower compressor and then longer run times, still dehumidifying the same with the longer run times coming in at the lower end of the manual J's. Follow me on that. Uh, only if the coil falls below the dew point temperature, right? Because uh, the coldest you can get the house, the coldest you can get the, the furthest you can get the dew point down to is the temperature of the evaporator coil. So, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. The longer run times will, will help, but it's not going to, it's still not going to get as dry as if you were able to drop the coil temperature down further. That's funny, you know, the difference in, how people think on different sides of the country, you know. I like longer run time too, but for a different reason. Here, you could have a perfectly well-designed duct system plugging in the winter, but come summer, it's 115, 118 degrees outside. When that unit shuts off, one room's hot. It don't matter how the ductwork's set up. 
the heat's coming in so fast from the side the sun's on, those people are hot in their bedroom, unless the air is actually moving. It's just the, the differences get so high. So, you know, we go, we're all about runtime, but just simply so we can even out the temperatures from room to room from that from that difference in heat load, you know. Having the ductwork in the attic sure doesn't help. Yeah, it's up there in the heat, that's for sure. Uh, heck, it's 150 in our attics, literally. I've said, I've, 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 well, that might be, it might be 140. Without That's not an exaggeration. It's 140 degrees up there sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, well, we uh, I just came back from uh, Arizona a couple weeks ago. We actually put a, some dry climate suggestions in the iManifold application because we were seeing some issues with uh, the other big challenge you guys have up there is uh, fixed orifice systems. They're, in, they're absolutely impossible to charge be correctly because the outdoor air temperature is too high and the humidity is too low for the, for the metering device to work properly. So your target superheats are always in the dash range or below five degrees on a fixed orifice system. You know, it's it's almost impossible to do what you guys need to do out there. You know, now that you mention it, your iron manifold has told me target superheat is like five almost every time. <laughs> yeah. Fixed rate. It, it's it's pretty much five. You're you're right. Yeah, because we won't let them calculate below five because that's what carrier. Uh, you can extrapolate it out below five. The, the problem becomes is what's called total measurement uncertainty. So every measurement you make has uncertainty in the measurement. Like your humidity is plus or minus, let's say, 1% relative humidity. Your temperature that we're measuring a return air dry bulb with is plus or minus one degree. Your suction line temperature is plus or minus a degree. You're measuring pressure at half percent accuracy, and it's got plus or minus, uh, let's say, 0.7 PSI. And so when you're calculating things out, all of those uncertainties multiply together. So the uncertainty in the I-manifold is probably about plus or minus 1.8 degrees for subcooling and plus or minus about 3 degrees for superheat. So if it called for 3 degrees of superheat and you charge to exactly 3 degrees, you could be at 0 or you could be at 6 because of your uncertainty because it's plus or minus 3 degrees. So right. when they tell you, you know, not to charge in the dash ranges, it's because with a typical analog gauge, you can only get at best plus or minus 5 degrees. And so what's going to happen is you could be at 0 or very close to 0 if you're at 5, so the manufacturers don't want you to go below 5 degrees of super heat. Right. And... And that's also leaving the evaporator where, you know, what about this? Where, you know, know, detecting superheat subcooling at the condenser, you know. But, uh, you know, Tim, I am, I am refrigeration, um, a guy. So, you know, I, 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 we won't, you're supposed to check it at the evaporator. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, for instance, um, what's that company? Uh, Heatcraft. Heatcraft wants 25 degrees of superheat, but six inches from the compressor, because that's what the compressor wants. <laughs> so you might want 10 leaving the evaporator, but you want 25 going into the compressor. And so checking at the checking your superheat outside, already you're going to want it to be higher than your than your target. Right. The, the, the challenge is, is um, you cannot accurately measure superheat at any point in the system unless you have a pressure and a temperature at the same location. Because if you were to measure your, like on, on train equipment, they used to always put a, uh, a suction pressure port at the evaporator outlet. And you could actually, what's really cool if you get on one of those systems, if you use a wireless pressure probe, is you can measure the pressure drop in the suction line and also the su uh, evaporator superheat and the total superheat. And what you'll find out is that there's usually a 3 to 5 PSI drop between the point that you're that you're typically measuring at at the condenser and the actual outlet of the evaporator coil, and right. so um, yeah, if you go to like the old the old Sporland charts and you see them, it used to tell you take the uh, pressure at the compressor, uh, add uh, two to three psi to get your your suction pressure at the evaporator, and then calculate your superheat that way. So right. You know, but the manufacturer have cheapened everything up to the point to where they're telling you measure total superheat at the con at the condensing unit, and basically what you're doing is making your suction line into a uh, into an extension of the evaporator coil. And that's one of those things that are minor. I, I, a lot of people overlook, but it's there. You know, I, I like 
more like a 20, like a 18, 20. If I'm looking for 10 upstairs, I want 18 outside, 15. Yep. You know? And what you could do, um, what I would do, a couple things if I was in your area, I would take my uh, one of my supplier, my return air temperature probe, plug a probe into the side of it, and uh, check temperature of the suction line at the outlet of the evaporator coil, and then monitor also at the inlet to the compressor, and look at your total superheat gain. It's a couple of things that I'll show you. If your suction line, let's say it came out at 50 degrees, and by the time it got to your, your condensing unit, you picked up you know additional 10 degrees, and you had a 60 degree suction line, it tells you you probably should add, have a little heavier insulation. I don't know what you guys run out there. Probably should be running half inch suction line insulation so you don't have a lot of additional superheat gain. Then that's one thing you can do. And then you could you could get your superheat closer to, uh, you know, map your suction line temperature over and get your get it closer to, uh, you know, five degrees superheat at the outlet of the evaporator. And, and, not, and then not make your, because you, you, here's the other thing that you, you got to remember. If you overfill the evaporator with warm liquid, you're just going to make it into a uh, into extension of the liquid line. Into extension of the liquid line. Hey, who's uh who's got the truck in the picture there? Is that Joe? Yes. Where, what part of the country are you in? Tallahassee. In Tallahassee. Yes. All sir. right. When you're doing your manual J's, you're actually running a. What, what kind of systems you run on there running 25 degrees? I, I have never seen anything running a evaporator coil at 25 degrees colder than the return air. Who's, who's making that system? Uh, Goodman in, in low stage. I do a lot of, uh, I've been doing some new construction zoned homes. Oh, you're well, talking on a, on a second stage cooling. It's running 25 degrees colder than the return air? You mean low stage cooling? Yeah, first stage, right? What I was getting at is, yeah. Now, you can have now, you Jim. I can make a I can make a single stage unit do the same thing as that unit is doing in low stage by just oversizing the evaporator. Oh, sure. Yeah, you can design it that way. Absolutely. Right. And what I'm doing is I'm just pulling less watts, and now I'm having to run longer. Um, are you having? Are you are you able to control humidity though with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, what kind of a are you looking at dew point temperatures, or what do you control? What, what what kind of what kind of humidity are you trying to control down to? It's fifty five at seventy five. Um, even I, I believe I plotted it out before, and I was still removing humidity, although it gets to be very little. Yeah, you know? I was going to say if if you just took seventy five minus twenty five, you're at a fifty degree evaporator. And if you're at a 50 degree evaporator, the dew point of the evaporator is a little above 50, so you can't get your humidity below 50. 50% 50 at 75, right? Yeah, right. because well, at, at yeah, exactly because well, at, when the, as it as it falls below 75, my evaporator should fall below 50. It's yeah, it will the, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If, it is the but it, it'll start to track it almost exactly. Um, so because whatever the Evaporator temp is that's the lowest you can get the dew point temperature in the house, right? Because right. at at 100 percent relative humidity, um, which is the condensing point of the coil uh, for the air, right? You're going to be at your dew point temperature, and and um, it's just interesting. I never I never seen. I mean, I understand obviously if you oversize the evaporator, you're going to raise the suction pressure, lower the compression ratio. Yeah, you uh, get more BTUs and it's in you know rated for. Insensible, you're going to get a lot more sensible BTUs, sensible, right. but your right. latent's going to drop in the, down to next to nothing. I think next to nothing? Yeah, yeah. I, I would think next to nothing. But the water's pouring out of the drain line. That's why I don't argue with it, you know? Yeah, well, it's you got more surface area, but it might pour yeah. out initially because your humidity's high, but I'm, I'm thinking about once it's down to, once the load's under control and you're talking it's, you know, uh, 75 in the house, and it's creeping up to 76. And what what are your customers setting their thermostats at most of the time? Some of them really like it cold at night, and they'll actually put it below 70, 68, and then they'll keep it 72 during the day. I can I haven't had a problem meeting sensible demand. No, no, and and you wouldn't have a problem with sensible demand. But I'm wondering if that's why they're dropping the temperatures down lowers because they 
can't get the uh, the humidity is too too high otherwise. Well, see, I have a feeling, Jim, that if we measured the amount, if we just measured the water coming out of the drain lines between two homes, one that was oversized compared to my home running a colder evaporator but cycling more because it's meeting the demand quicker, mm -hmm. and then measured the water coming out of a unit that's running longer, but it is, of course, a warmer evaporator, but it's running near constantly. How is it running near constantly without satisfying the sensible uh, demand faster? Because if you've got more sensible cooling, that's what's going to satisfy the thermostat. So are you undersizing the system and oversizing the VAP? Is that what you're telling me? I'm not saying I undersize it, but I'm saying when it is 95, which is our design day, mm -hmm. you would probably have to run near constant to do 72. You have to play around with that a little bit. But I do have one question I'd love to get your insight on. I've found water collecting on the blower housing, and I've been trying to figure out, is the air coming off as like a vapor of the, almost like a fog? It's at 100% saturation. Well, and it, then it, how could it recondense on the blower housing? Well, you're uh, talking about a draw-through type evaporator, right? Yeah, air handler, yep. So the only thing that will do that is if your airflow is excessive and it's pulling the water off the evaporator coil. Okay. Because the, the air will always be at 100% relative humidity when it comes off an evaporator coil or close to it, minus the bypass factor of the coil. All right? Yeah, because right, what I had seen was like 0.8 or 80%, something like that. Yeah, so if it's 80% relative humidity, it's not raining in there, right? But it is condensing on the evaporator coil, but, the, but there's some air that's called, there's a bypass factor of a coil, there's some air that goes through the evaporator coil that's not conditioned. And that's when you look at the, uh, have you ever gone into the performance section of the iManifold app? Yes. All right, there's one that's called bypass factor, and it calculates, with it, yes. yeah, it calculates the bypass factor of the coil. So the only thing that'll do what you're saying is if your air velocity across the coil is too high, above probably about 700 feet per minute, it actually pulls the water off the coil and, and the droplets are hitting the evaporator coil. Yeah, I'm having some new installations where it's just a manufacturer's design problem that's causing this, so it's not pretty. Yeah, no, <laughs> I don't know exactly what you're saying, but I was thinking it, it really looked like the water was recondensing on the blower housing. It was just odd because it, it, in order for that to happen, the housing would have to drop below the dew point temperature of the air. What I was thinking, Jim, is on its off cycles. Don't you think that? coil kind of warms up from the liquid migrating to it, uh, and then the, it kind of re -evaps the moisture on the big coil. If, if you were to, um, it, it's actually funny, if you were to uh, cycle off your air conditioning and have the probes still in the ductwork, what you're going to see is that you still have a bunch of sensible cooling going on because the evaporator coil at that point becomes an evaporative cooler because there's all this water on it and it starts to re-evaporate and it'll actually cool the air down until all the water evaporates off the coil. I have a video of that online. It's on uh, Jim Bergman 3 YouTube channel I did for TrueTech Tools. It's on the uh, SPD2, the uh, BOP Index Psychrometer, where I actually show how that's working, because that's a really good psychrometer to show that. Yeah, that was a neat video. I think I saw that one. And, and that's what happens. It, it just becomes an evaporative cooler, so it's probably not recondensing on there. It's probably just pulling water off the coil. It could be because the way their blower's designed, it's creating a like a, a vortex, two little yeah. vortex tornadoes and just pulling the water right off of it. Yeah. Well, I'm going to bail out then. I'll talk to you guys later, and uh, maybe I'll see you again in one of these chat rooms here. Adios.